Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, and welcome to the 2022 Stethoscope Ceremony. Uh, my name is Michael Bray. Uh, I had to check my notes. My name is Michael Bray, uh, and I'm a graduate of the class of 2022. Uh, I'm a proud member of Towsett College. Uh, woo! All right. Uh, I'm a current psychiatry resident here at Hopkins. Uh, and before I traded all of my physical fitness for uh, fun facts about renal tubular acidosis and the clotting cascade, I was the Maryland state champion in the Olympic triathlon. Uh, it's an understatement to say, oh, <laughs> woo, thank you. Uh, it really is an understatement to say what an absolute pleasure it is to be with you today. Uh, you know, it, it really seems like moments ago that I was in your seats. Um, I, I think that you'll find the time goes by incredibly quickly. Uh, I want to start by welcoming all of you and congratulating you on becoming a part of this ever-expanding tapestry that is the Johns Hopkins uh, Medicine Institution. Uh, I can't wait to see the discoveries, the stories, and the moments of profundity that you will weave into that tapestry. I truly believe that this institution is something special, uh, that it's a place that will empower you to reach a potential that will almost certainly surprise you. Um, I think that it's a place with a culture of mentorship, sponsorship, and investment in one another. Uh, these are values that you will carry with you throughout your career, no matter where it takes you. Uh, this stethoscope represents one of the first steps in your clinical journey. But it also represents that culture of investment in one another, uh, of using the resources at your disposal to elevate those around you, which is what makes this place so special. Uh, today, that sponsorship, the stethoscopes, it's financial. But for, for you, and frankly, myself on an intern salary, that uh, those resources are your knowledge, your kindness, your passion, uh, and your, I very much encourage you that whenever you're able to do so, please give those generously. Uh, remember to give them to your, your patients, your peers, your interprofessional teammates, and to those who come after you. Though through the very stethoscope that's sitting in front of you right now, uh, you will almost certainly hear things that will change lives. I, I can say that with a uh, good degree of certainty because I know I have and I'm a psychiatrist. <laughs> um, you know, it, it will equip you with an incredible power and responsibility to, to care and to lead. Uh, and in doing so, uh, I hope that you always remember to be kind, be kind to yourselves, be kind to those that you lead, uh, to those that you teach, uh, and to each other. All right. Thank you for this chance to celebrate with you. Before we proceed, uh, I'd like to share a few brief instructions with you. So first, uh, you've all got a stethoscope in front of you. Please don't open the box until uh, we all open it together at the right moment. Uh, second, you'll notice blank thank you cards in front of you. I think many of you have already filled them out, but uh, if you haven't, take a moment to fill out a brief thank you note to the donors who uh, made these stethoscopes possible today. Um, there's no need to address them to anyone in particular. Dear doctor is perfect. Uh, perhaps most importantly, please enjoy tonight the celebration and the speakers that you're going to hear. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michelle Shermack, uh, counselor of the Johns Hopkins Medicine Alumni Association. Michelle. <laughs> Well, it's really exciting to be here. Um, I uh, want to say good evening to everybody and welcome to the stethoscope ceremony uh, sponsored by the Johns Hopkins Medical Alumni Association. Um, I'm Michelle Shermack um, and a counselor in the organization. Um, so I matriculated here from 1988, back in the Stone Ages, uh, to 92. And then I did plastic surgery residency here from 92 to 98. And then I joined faculty. I was at Bayview for 11 years, up until about 12 years ago, and then went into private practice um, in plastic surgery in Lutherville, if you guys ever need anything. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I was asked to share some memories, and I have so many great memories. But I have to say, I went to uh, Franklin and Marshall, where Dr. Ziegelstein's uh, daughter went. 
And, um, you know, when I applied to schools, I came here, I was probably like the last one to be interviewed on my day. My interviewer came really late, and I was just sitting around like nervously, smiling and anxious, hanging out with Ed Junkins, who was a year ahead of me, who was, you know, assigned to keep me, you know, occupied. And um, it was just a great feeling, and I, you know, I'm from Baltimore. Um, I never thought I would necessarily stay here, but um, the school was just so enticing with all the history. My um, father, who was a pharmacist, had a small store about um, a mile up in Highland Town. I think he used to stop in the admissions office um, probably monthly to check on my application, which would mortify most people, but actually really endeared me to that. So um, those are just some memories from uh, back when I was a medical student here. It was great times. Um, I'd like to share with you a few words about the medical alumni, the Medicine Alumni Association. Um, the group was formed in 1940, and it was a merger of the uh, Medical Society and the Surgical Association, and they joined together to form the Johns Hopkins Medical and Surgical Association. Um, at our reunion and alumni weekend this past June, the name was actually evolved to the Johns Hopkins Medicine Alumni Association to be more inclusive of the over 35,000 alumni that include fellow resident, fellows, residents, and medical and graduate alumni. Um, even though the name has changed, the mission hasn't, and it's multifold. Um, first, uh, we support projects that improve the quality of life for medical and graduate students. We serve as an informational conduit by support of the Johns Hopkins Medicine Magazine that if you guys don't receive it now, you'll receive it as alumni, and it's, it really is a, a nice piece of literature to receive. Um, we also plan the um, Alumni Association meeting, and hopefully you'll all get to participate this June. It's a great time for reunions. You'll get to see some of these you know, alumni coming through, um, and that's a really fun time. Um, we assist uh, medical students with purchasing these stethoscopes, and these are actually provided uh, to you uh, by the Alumni Association. Um, we also pride, provide financial support for the Medical Student Senate, the Graduate Student Association, House Staff Council, Postdoctoral Association, and more. You will automatically become a member of the Alumni Association when you graduate. So why am I involved? I'm involved because I'm grateful for the education I received at Hopkins, and most of all, for my memories and outstanding role models who trained me here, including Dr. Ziegelstein. Um, you will um, truly stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, so I was also asked to share a special memory re related to the stethoscopes, and I'm a, I'm a surgeon, so, um, you know, the stethoscope is a nice little ornament for me, but, um, uh, you know, when we started clinical skills as first years, uh, my uh, partner was, is a woman named Stephanie Factor, um, and if you guys ever get to Mount Sinai in New York, you should definitely look her up. She's just an amazing uh, personality. Um, so we had a group of two, and we were actually assigned to Dr. David Levine, who was head of internal medicine. I think he recently um, retired. Uh, but really, what a special um, opportunity to train in clinical skills with the head of internal medicine. And I became a surgeon. What a waste. But anyway, um, you may wonder why we give you stethoscopes when there are so many other things we could give. The reason is you will hopefully keep your stethoscope for a very long time, and you have to be careful with them, and remember the generosity of the colleagues who preceded you. The stethoscope is probably the most universal symbol of being a doctor. Our alumni like to pay it forward and donated the 118 stethoscopes that you'll receive tonight. Um, you'll find what we like to call prescriptions for success in your boxes. Um, these words of wisdom are shared with you by stethoscope donors. Um, I actually missed submitting mine, so I'm going to provide you a couple of my own. Um, number one is um, enjoy your class. Um, I know that you're doing more things remotely, and I understand that a lot of the education is basically watching 
you know, videos and things, but, you know, we used to all pile into our lecture hall and, and those relationships are really, you know, undeniably some of the best that I've ever had. You're an amazingly special cohort, all rising stars. I felt most at home in medical school and really enjoyed my class. Like always, we had individuals from all over the country and the world with diverse talents, interests, and POVs. I never laughed so hard or had so much fun, honestly. We worked hard, but we also played hard. Um, now I have colleagues who are dear friends in all kinds of medical fields who are no further than a call or a text away. Um, number two, appreciate the resources available to you at Hopkins and take full advantage. Choose to work with a leader in their field. Consider an MPH. Take a class at Peabody. Spend time outside of the classroom with your classmates. The opportunities here are truly endless and will create great memories and opportunities for your future. Number three, find great mentors. They will not find you. Um, and generally, as a student here, doors are open. So if there is somebody who you want to spend time with or talk to, um, just make an appointment and they will see you. Um, they're happy to do that. Number four, follow your passion. You know, it was a tough decision for me as a young woman, woman to choose surgery as a field. Uh, but whatever gets you excited, you'll make it work. So definitely keep your eyes open and follow your passion. And number five, keep a close eye on that stethoscope. Take my word for it. It might disappear kind of quickly. Um, so um, uh, we already talked about the thank you notes, and those will be collected and shared with the alumni. And please enjoy tonight. And remember this moment for the next four years. This is a picture of me in 1988, fully, you know, my white coat, my stethoscope. We didn't get to have a ceremony. We just kind of threw it all on and got going. Um, but um, these were really good memories. And pouring through these uh, pictures was really fun for me. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Roy Ziegelstein. He's the Vice Dean for Education to the stage. Thank you so much. This is a picture of me from 1988. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, it's not. Um, well, this is a really great night, and uh, I'm really pleased to be able to speak to all of you. Um, how many of you know what a heliograph is? I didn't think so. So <clears throat> let me explain why I'm starting my comments with this. A heliograph is a tool that was used more than 100 years ago to send messages over long distances. You've probably seen it in somewhere, a movie or a science class. Basically, it's on a tripod, and it uses the, the light from the sun. So basically, if it's a cloudy day, forget it. You can't send messages. It's got to be a sunny day. And there's a mirror on the tripod, and the person basically directs the mirror to send flashes of light across long distances in Morse code. I'm done. No, so, so why, why am I starting by telling you that? Well, chances are if, if we were giving you a heliograph today, you would say, what? Um, I would prefer a cell phone. So you might ask, um, why are we giving you a tool today that is well more than 100 years old, and in fact, hasn't changed much in more than 100 years. I'm going to tell you. Um, so, you know, some people would say, you need a more modern tool. And in fact, Eric Topol, a cardiologist, prominent cardiologist in this country, who, as an aside, trained here at Hopkins, he actually said in 2011, while he was demonstrating the use of this device, which I carry in my pocket, I'm a cardiologist, by the way, I carry in my pocket all the time when I'm seeing patients. This is a portable ultrasound, okay? It's about the size of your cell phone. It's not much bigger. It has a transducer. And I can take very, you know, clear, very sophisticated pictures of uh, the heart, um, of the patient I'm seeing using ultrasound gel. 
He was demonstrating the use of this to an audience just like you. And he said, quote, why would you listen to a heart when you have an ultrasound in your pocket? I told you I'm going to tell you why, OK? So let me, let me do something for a second. So I'm going to put the microphone down to the table here. Oh, it's back. OK. I want you to tell me what you hear. How many sounds with each stroke? Two. So some people said two. Most people just looked at me like they had no idea <laughs> what I was doing. So that is two. This would be one. I'm going to show you two. Now one. Two. One. Now, to many of you, to many of you, that will sound the same. Correct? Yeah. Admit it. OK. Because the two are separated by only a very, very small fraction of a second. That actually is how the second heart sound is split. It's, it's, it's just a fraction of a second. And right now, if you listen to a person's heart, instead of lub-dub, or S1, S2, or boom-boom, or doot-doot, or whatever you want to say, um, that's what you should be hearing is, two sounds, actually, for the second heart sound for sure, and sometimes for the first. That's called splitting of the second heart sound, because the second heart sound is made up of the closure of the aortic and pulmonic valves. Now, you're not going to hear that now, but I guarantee you, if you listen carefully and do it over and over and over and over, you will absolutely hear the difference between those two sounds, absolutely. And now I'm going to tell you a story of why you need a stethoscope. This is an actual patient story. A nurse here at Johns Hopkins saw me about 10 or 11 years ago. She had been to see two prior, two other cardiologists, not here at Hopkins. She had palpitations. They were extremely bothersome. She would have them sometimes during the day, and sometimes they would even wake her up at night. It was extremely bothersome to her. She saw two cardiologists and tried to tell them her story. They didn't listen to her. Listening, as Dr. Bray here will tell you, who talked to you about listening with the stethoscope, is about more than just listening with the stethoscope. It's about listening to your patients. So it turns out that they didn't really listen to her. Both cardiologists told her that she had anxiety, and that's why she had palpitations. And there was a big problem with that diagnosis. The big problem was she wasn't anxious at all. Basically, they passed her off as being anxious when she was not. The other problem is they were cardiologists, and they missed something very important. That was what's called fixed splitting of the second heart sound. So it would sound like this. Instead of the closeness that I showed you, it would sound like this. OK, wide and fixed splitting. There's, there's really not much in the heart that gives you that other than an atrial septal defect, which is a, a hole between the two top chambers of the heart. That hole can cause arrhythmias that can lead to palpitations. Now you might say, how could the cardiologist have miss it? missed it? Both cardiologists ordered an echo, both of them, an echocardiogram, a very sophisticated, expensive test. In both cases, the conventional echocardiogram was normal, and in fact, when I took out my small device and echoed her in the, in the office, the echo was pretty normal. But the fixed splitting of the second heart sound that I heard with my stethoscope revealed that diagnosis. And in fact, I said to her, I'm pretty convinced you have an atrial septal defect. We need to do a transesophageal echo, make the diagnosis, and then treat you. So she had the transesophageal echo. She was treated with a, a 
closure device that Dr. John Resar, whom hopefully you'll get to know here at Hopkins, did. And she's been completely asymptomatic the last 10 or 11 years, and she's completely healthy and um, unfortunately had to move from, Hop from Baltimore for her family, but otherwise she'd be a nurse that you might interact with on the ward. So the, the point here is that the ultrasound is great. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a technophobe. The cell phone is great too, by the way. Um, this is great, I carry it with me all the time, but I use my stethoscope all the time, okay? Now, I'm gonna quickly show you how to use your stethoscope. Open your box, that's the first part. Okay, you ready? Take a look up here while you're opening your box. This is a stethoscope. Okay? Stethoscope. Um, the stethoscope has two ends. Don't try putting this end in your ears. Use this end to put in your ears. This is a lot like an AirPod. Okay? There you go. It, 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 it is supposed to be pretty much occlusive in your ear. So angle it forward. Actually, these have sort of a, a built-in angle. Angle it forward in your ear so that the, the angle is facing the front of your face, your nose, in most cases. Okay? Can you still hear me, by the way? <laughs> okay. Um, this end has two sides. One is a diaphragm. It's the bigger one. Okay, the diaphragm, I don't know if I'm yelling, sorry. The diaphragm um, listens well, or it allows you to hear well, high frequency sounds like the first and second heart sound. The other side is the bell. The bell in some stethoscopes is shaped almost a little cone-like. This one is fairly flat. The bell allows you to hear low frequency sounds, some murmurs, some bruies, which are noises in the blood vessels, and, a cer and certain other sounds are heard better with the bell. The bell is applied to the chest fairly loosely, not with, not with hard pressure. In fact, you can convert the bell into a diaphragm by pressing harder on the bell. The diaphragm should have a firm seal on the chest, and ideally, you know, not on a rib, but you know, sort of between the ribs so that you can listen to the heart or lungs or whatever else you're listening to. So again, two ends. Um, you're going to learn in CFM how to use it, right, Dr. Bray? Um, and no matter what you go into, actually, I think the stethoscope is important, but certainly whatever you go into, listening is important. So that's all that I have to say. I'm happy to afterwards, if you all want to, if anyone wants to come up for a private tutoring lesson, I'm happy to provide you, but you're going to have ample opportunity. Um, congratulations on receiving your stethoscope. Use it uh, well. And it's a pleasure now to introduce Dr. Ted DeWeese, my colleague and friend and the interim dean and CEO of our school and Johns Hopkins Medicine. Good evening, everyone. Let me just be clear. I got none of the cool stuff. Roy's the cardiologist. I've treated men with prostate cancer for the last 20 odd years, so you don't want to hear the sounds that I hear when I'm <laughs> examining people, just to be clear about that. Um, so it is a real honor uh, for me uh, on this really wonderful night to welcome you to the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine family. I know you've had a few of those uh, events already, but it really means a lot to me to be able to say that to you uh, directly. Um, my vocabulary is, and I truly mean this, my vocabulary is not broad or sufficient enough to tell you or to describe for you the journey that you're going to be on and just the absolute wonder that you will um, experience. It is an awesome career. Uh, you're going to love every minute of it. Um, the opportunity to be a part of someone's life uh, at their most happy moment, sometimes at the most tragic moment. Um, to be that person who they will share intimate details with that they would not share with the closest member of their family, but they will tell you 
for the, in the first moment that they meet you, that you'll have an opportunity to lay hands on them, to diagnose and to treat them, give that someone trusts you enough, you will become that trusted person. Um, it is an awesome both responsibility but such an honor to be that close to someone in their life to be able to provide them the support they need during this most difficult time. So you're um, in for an unbelievable career. You've heard from Roy, from Michelle, uh, from Dr. Bray, what these, what these, this life of service to the people to improve human health means, and it's gonna be just a great ride. So, I did receive my stethoscope in my first year of medical school. At my medical school, I had to buy it, not that I'm still bitter about that or anything, um, <clears throat> but it was wonderful, so that is a great thing you have. So I remember getting it, and we got it in the next week. Uh, we had our first physical exam class. So we went in, you were with, as Michelle described, a part, partner from the class. <clears throat> you got to put it on the chest, and wow, it was just, I still remember it to this day, so wonderful to do that. Now we were in a part of a, the uh, year where we were doing renal physiology, and let me just tell you, that's not that much fun. Uh, just going through the acid base and figuring out. So we were working hard and we had a test that next week. So everybody had been up late studying, et cetera. Went to the next physical exam course. And of course, we got then to go up to the cardiac floor to try to listen to these sounds that uh, Dr. Ziegelstein tried so desperately to show you. Um, I couldn't hear one damn thing. And it was so deflating. And you know what the fact is? The cardiologists love that. They are masochists. They will push you and, and particularly, well, never mind. Um, so, but they love that. So, but I, I, I just love physical exams. So I got home. I was very tired. Um, I decided, you know what? I'm just going to lay down, pull my shirt off, put the stethoscope, as Dr. Zilgeslein just described for you, put it on my chest, trying to listen to those sounds. But I had been up so late the night before Next thing I know, my girlfriend walks into the apartment, now my wife, by the way, same, and wakes me up, startles me it's completely, and is, I see her laughing, and I realize I pulled this out. I had had those stethoscope in my ear for almost two hours, and let me tell you, the pain was unbelievable, only to be outdone by the bruising of my ego with her laughing so hard at me. So anyway, it was um, still to this day, that time of getting that stethoscope, being able to listen to another human being's heart, even my own at one point, and um, I still have the exact same stethoscope to this day. I used it through my all medical school, my internship, my residency, my fellowship, and all my years as a practicing physician at this hospital. Now, it has a few parts and pieces that I've had to replace, not unlike what Dr. Zugelstein's had in his life. A few parts and pieces have been replaced. Um, <laughs> but we probably shouldn't really go there because there's a HIPAA violation that might come along with that. Um, but, but I still value it very much and it means a great deal to me to reflect back on both my medical student uh, classmates and all the patients that I have seen and use that. I, I, many, 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 many thousands of patients I've had the opportunity to help manage. So um, you're, have you heard your stethoscope was provided by the real generosity of the um, Hopkins Medical Alumni Association and its alumni donors, and I can speak for the School of Medicine how grateful we are, Michelle, for you and the team to have provided that to these students. Um, I've already said you're embarking on just the unbelievable journey of your life. Um, enjoy every possible moment of it. There'll be ups and downs, but they'll all be the mosaic that will make you the great physicians that I know you will be. You are the best medical class in the United States, and I don't say that lightly, you are the next leaders of medicine. And so when you come back here in 20 years and 30 years to talk to the medical students who will be exactly in your same position, remember this day, it's gonna be so important, and remember that others that went ahead of you were confident enough in you, confident enough in your future to give the gift that they've given you tonight, and they will continue to pay that forward. So it's again, really my pleasure and honor to welcome you to the family that is the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Thank you all, and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Bray.
All right, thank you, Dr. Deweese. Uh, so just a couple housekeeping notes uh, as we end the evening. So please leave the thank you notes that you've completed on the table in front of you. Uh, we'll collect them after you leave and we'll mail them to the donors. Uh, when you exit the, the auditorium, you may already have seen, but there's a, a box dinner in the lobby. Uh, please, only, I think this maybe goes without saying, but please only take a special meal if you ordered a special meal. Um, we also have a, a photo booth for you to enjoy. I saw many of you have already found it. Uh, please take lots of pictures to memorialize this uh, great night. Um, we'll provide you with the photos for free uh, after the event. Um, all right, that's it. So we hope that you've enjoyed this evening. And on behalf of the Johns Hopkins Medicine Alumni Association, uh, we wish you the very best as you embark on your medical career. All right, thank you. Thank you.